Hello and welcome to Warcraft Daily for today, the 21st of uh, December 2013. So in today's news, we have quite a few different things. First of all, we have some talk about flying from Bashiok. Then moving on, we have a very interesting little poll thingy about sub races. And then finally, I'm going to round off the show with a, well, quite a long Q&A about uh, Heroes of the Storm, which I think is actually kind of interesting. Heroes of the Storm's looking great and it should provide quite a fun experience for everyone, including the WoW people. So first of all, flying. Well, they said that using flight paths between predetermined travel points isn't really an argument to remove them, um, because, or sorry, isn't really an argument to remove the need to um, be on the ground to work towards objectives. Things are not really linked just because of flight. Basically what this means, um, that's kind of just stuff that Bashiok said, but basically what he means when he says that is that um, flight points are a means to get between different gameplay areas, and the gameplay areas themselves are designed to be tackled um, on foot. And uh, this is stuff that I will get into in a, in a bit, but there are there are far more decisions that you need to make while you are in one of these, uh, you know, areas and, and stuff like that um, on foot, because you can't just fly over stuff. And then the reason for flight, it's really just for, like, a convenience, because Blizzard, they, they still do understand that if you have to uh, spend 10 minutes, um, like, traveling somewhere in your mount, that it's not really particularly fun. That's why they're adding in the flight points. I just really hope that they do a very good job of making the flight points make sense. Some of the old ones on, uh, on um, like in just the, the regular like vanilla world, they are so bad in terms of the pathing. But anyway, they also said that there is a reason that flying is not allowed in battlegrounds and raids, and that's because flying is a travel mechanic and not a gameplay mechanic. And I know that this sounds like an odd comparison for him to make, but their whole point is that uh, if you could fly over parts of Siege of Orgrimmar or Alteric Valley, you just end up with a hollow gameplay experience because, sure, you'd miss out on things which you might regard as being, uh, you know, they take time to really give much reward. You'll be skipping those, but overall it would just feel hollow. And um, often there needs to be stuff that you, um, just like in the way for you to progress through in order for the game to feel fun. For an example, a lot of people don't really like, um, yeah, let's just say, uh, Trial of the Crusader. A lot of people didn't end up liking the fact that it had no trash. Everyone, uh, initially was really excited because here's a raid coming, it has no trash, and it's just bosses. Some people like that, um, well, actually most people like that initially. Then what we all found after a few weeks is that it just, it kind of felt like you got through things a bit too quickly and uh, you sort of blew through it. There was never really any, like, pacing at all, I guess. It was either you're fighting a boss or you're listening to Tyrion talk. So, uh, yeah, there basically just wasn't really that much pacing there. And, of course, there were there were also, of course, other big problems with uh, Trial of the Crusader. We had the whole issue of, you know, you could, uh, you could do it in 10 player, 25 player, then 10 heroic, 25 heroic. And because it was that short, if you were being, if you're like serious about raiding, you didn't really had to do that. So that place did have other issues, but definitely the trash problem was one of them. And there are other examples of mechanics like this. There's the fact that sometimes there will be somewhere that you need to get and you need to get through a bunch of mobs first. Or say repair mechanics, stuff like that that just... Like, they are there kind of to create the um, the world in which epic things can happen, and if they're there, people may not necessarily lament their passing, but they will, I suppose, realize that things feel a little bit hollow because they're gone. It's the sort of thing they might even not realize that the reason the game feels hollow is because some of these mechanics are gone, but it'll just be that kind of underlying, niggling feeling that they can't really point their finger at. Anyway, let's get back to the ground. So, a lot of having you on the ground is making a choice. So if you're going through, this is just said by Bashiok, if you're going through, um, uh, like, just a place or something, and you see some mobs, you have to make the decision to either run around them or go through them and risk being dismounted. And this applies to both questing and regular travel. Bashiok mentioned that some people say, because I um, can put thought and effort into potentially avoiding unnecessary combat, that those combat situations shouldn't exist. And he said that this logic can be applied to nearly any game mechanic, which is absolutely true. But it's not a good, uh, it's not a good argument for removing them. There are a lot of things which, as I said, just exist because there needs to be a baseline game in which all these epic moments and things like that can happen. And if you strip out a lot of those things, then the game just feels streamlined, not very fun, and people can't put their finger on it and they just put it down to, yeah, the game's not as good anymore. I think when a lot of people talk about vanilla, and a lot of people really rem reminisce about it. It had 
I think in some regards, maybe too many of those annoying mechanics and you know, things like, I don't know, maybe in the Burning Crusade you had attunements. They, um, the, the, those mechanics were in the same sort of bracket, I'd, I'd say, but I just don't think, I think they were maybe just a little bit too overbearing. But having the less overbearing ones still in the game, I think is actually really important to just get, like, keeping it feeling like, uh, like a game, really. It has to have their it ha its highs and its lows, and if you take out some of the low moments, then the whole thing just it starts to fumble, like fumble apart. Fuck it, we're making fumble. Fumble is a new word, and with that uh, shocking bombshell, let's move on to sub races. So while I was browsing through the news blogs, I saw this poll on MMO Champion about sub races, and it was pretty interesting. It was a good topic. I'll just go through the results here. Uh, one second. Yes. Yeah, so. 46.63% of people said yes, with additional lore and gameplay for the sub-races and unlocking them. 15% uh, said yes, with additional lore and gameplay for the sub-races. 5% said yes, with additional lore and gameplay just for unlocking them. And then 25% uh, said yes, just for the models. And then about 10% said no. This basically means that, okay, while some people want them to be introduced in a, maybe a different way, the vast majority of people, 90% pretty much, want there to be sub-races in the game. Now, what would a sub-race be? Well, I think the easiest example for people to to think of is, say, uh, if you had uh, a dwarf, right? And then you can choose between either being a wild hammer dwarf or um, an ironforged dwarf, uh, bronze beer dwarf even, or perhaps a dark iron. Or an, I think another great example, and this is something that they probably would have done if they were adding blood elves into the game now. And actually, it's funny that... Uh, High Elves being, in the words of Draenor, a speculation video that I did before BlizzCon. One thing, the amount of absolute fucking retards that uh, have decided to comment on that video and make complete tits out of themselves, and they can't even read a bloody date in a video, but anyway. A lot of people seem to think that, oh, they're just the same race, blah blah blah. Well, first of all, no, they're not. There's a very distinct difference in schism between Blood Elves and High Elves. But, uh, what would, I'd say, happen is, you would just make it so that that default kind of elf was something where Alliance could choose High and Horde could choose Blood. Uh, maybe for humans, I, I don't know, maybe there's... Well, it's kind of a bit different for humans, I mean, maybe if we had, like, somewhere where it was just other than, you know, your typical kind of... Well, your typical race of completely, like, homogeneous, um, r race of white dudes, Maybe if, you know, if there was other worlds or others, you know, we find an, an island where people maybe look a bit different or something, which would be really cool, by the way, I'm totally for that happening in the game, then maybe you could choose what kind of human you are, maybe there's fucking leaper gnomes or whatever get freed and then you can play as them. I think there's cool stuff, like say if you're an orc, um, right now you can choose between a, I think you, can you choose to be a brown-skinned orc? I'm not really sure, but I know some orcs like say Garrosh are because they're not as tainted by the whole corrupt and Corrupted? No, the whole corruption thing. So perhaps you have maybe another sub-race of orcs or the uncorrupted ones and you can choose those. What sub-races allow, allows like Blizzard to do is just add in more lore-friendly and different races for all of our different species, I suppose. Because we always say the races of Azeroth and the species of Azeroth. I guess it's more, well, it's the species, not the races, so having different races within those species I think would be really, really cool. I'd like to be able to choose a different kind of orc or a different kind of human, or maybe if, if you take night elves, maybe there's some other group of night elves. Although that that's a, there would end up being just a lot of elves, wouldn't there? Um, but yeah, I'm trying to think what other races could really lend themselves well to a sub-race thing. I mean, goblins, they, from what I can see so far, they really all kind of look the same. Um, with goblins because they're just kind of little green dudes and they all come from the same island, which I suppose makes sense. Worgen are just, they're just fucking Worgen, what can you do? Pandaren, they all come from the same place, we know what a Pandaren looks like, I don't think there's any sub-races in there. Uh, Torin? I mean, like we have different kinds of cows, but I don't, yeah, nah, no Torin. Um, what else? Trolls, yeah, there's different kinds of, there are different races of trolls. There's the Sand Fury, there's Forest Trolls. Um, well, I doubt we'd be getting the Drakari, but there's different kinds of trolls, so maybe we can have sub-races of trolls and, and general things like that. I think it's really nice, actually, if they could do that. It puts a little bit more art into the game and means that everyone's character can feel just a little bit different. So, yeah, I'm all for sub-races. That's, that's a good thing. And, uh, yeah, so let's move on to some other stuff. Heroes of the Storm, there's a giant Q&A, and I did actually 
kind of look, you know, look at this a few days ago when it happened, but I never really got a chance to fit it into a show, and I was just going to do an individual, like, video where I talk about them in detail, but... Yeah, let's not do that. I'll just cover the whole thing now, and if you're a world person, this is still relevant to you. This is Blizzard's next game, and it really, really does look great. So, map design. They said that the map design will change on a map-by-map -map basis, which means that in terms of, like, how you play, uh, heroes are going to be different, your strategies are different, your talents are different. It seems like map design really does have a great bearing on the actual gameplay. They also said the games will be 20 minutes and under, which feels better, I'd agree and that um, they want it to be friendly to new players, so to kind of aid them in this, there, there's going to be shared experience points between teams so that you can't really get ultra far behind. There's going to be no kill stealing, since killing is supposed to be good for your team, therefore the entire team should be rewarded, and at least like people that are near the kill, I suppose. And uh, they're also trying to make it so that losing doesn't feel as bad, and I think one of the things that really contributes to that is that it's 20 minutes. It's not like in Dota where if you lose, you could have just wasted 40 minutes of your life and there's just no payoff. That's also a reason why people get so toxic in LoL and Dota. So next, they said there's no gold and XP is shared, and when you level, then you get access to more talents. And anyone in the team that is near a kill, I'm assuming it's just a, like a player kill, is um, that anyone that's near that kill will get some experience, and they, they said that this allows for a little bit more fun and movement on the map. Next, when they were talking about one or two maps in specific, they said that the Dragon Knight, who is a, a map feature on the Dragonshire, will be able to move around the place and kick enemy heroes back quite a distance. He's a, like a limited duration thing, and quite a few maps have a thing like this. So maybe there's an objective, and once you complete that objective, maybe you summon a, another hero who is on your team, or... Um, just a special map mechanic. There was a pretty cool one with a pirate map, so when you collect enough pirate treasure, the pirate would uh, start attacking the enemy and bombarding them with the ship. So I thought that was really cool. Now next on the topic of disconnects, they said that if you disconnect from a game, you get nothing from it, and if you disconnect too often, you will start to earn less in future games. Now this is actually combating a very big problem in League and Dota, where, say in, uh, in Dota, as a good example, there's no surrender um, functionality, at least I don't think so. Which means that if someone leaves from, like, someone just leaves from your team, okay, they don't get anything, but there's a big issue there, your team can't win, and I think you get still get penalized for disconnecting. I'm not too sure if they fix that, but I really think they should. Still, this whole disconnects thing has been a major problem in MOBAs, because they do last quite a while, and some people think, well, if I'm not winning now, I'm never gonna win, then they just leave which is kind of sucky. So, um, yeah, if you disconnect normally, then you can reconnect, and then while you're not there, the AI will take over um, for you while you are AFK, which is quite nice. And then if you leave fully, I think the AI will still take over for you. So that's really nice. It means you're not going to be as gimped if someone leaves. They're also debating the um, this, this whole sort of thing where your entire team hits level 10 at once, which means you all get um, access to your ultimate ability at the same time. Now, there's a bit of a problem where if one team gets like hits that breakpoint faster than the other team, that's fine, they probably earned it. But there's an issue there where the power like difference between the two teams is absolutely ginormous. So for 30 seconds, the t like the enemy or like one of the teams can win one or two team battles, which would really just put a massive just really massively, like, put back the other team, so that could be an issue, and they're still debating it. Next, they said that heroes will have some generic talents, and that some special ones, like, say, Abathur, who's a really cool-looking hero, will have, uh, unique, like, unique ones. So basically, every hero is gonna have a few unique talents, but there will be some generic ones to pass about the place. I think that's fine, it's a good way to do it, and that it keeps... It means that just by playing here, you already understand quite a few talents, but every new hero will have new ones, which probably makes sense when you read them. I think this is just really good for the readability and accessibility for the game, and that's a great thing. Next, for esports, they said that this is a thing that's being left to players. Like with StarCraft 2, they're just going to provide the tools and let people handle it. Personally, I think they should just do more to push it. If you, you have things like Riot and LCS, um, Dota and the International, these are massively successful events which have got the company behind the game invested in them in some regard. Blizzard, they have the money, you know? They should be able to do this, they just, they just don't. StarCraft 2 could be really big, um, Heroes of the Storm could be really big, and I don't really think that they will hit, at, at least in terms of prize money and that kind of thing, they won't really hit where they possibly could because Blizzard don't support them that well. It's a bit of a problem. Then when they actually did go in and tried to support StarCraft 2, they ended up absolutely fucking it up. And while things have got better and like as the seasons have went on, the initial damage was terrible. They killed off 
the, the, part of the reason, like, they, they're certainly one of the contributing factors as to why MLG don't have StarCraft 2 anymore. A few smaller tournaments had to forego StarCraft 2, or at least sort of change up their format, which was definitely a bit of a problem. Now, they did confirm there will be an Observer mode, just like in StarCraft 2, because it's all in the same tech, and that they do want to add a map editor, but they're not sure when. Also, they are going to keep working and polishing the game to make it feel better. One of the recent additions they made is death. Um, no, not death, uh, physics on deaths. Now, this is really cool. If you've ever watched a competitive StarCraft 2 match, you'll notice that uh, sometimes, like, if a Zergling gets hit by a Widow Mine, the Zergling will, like, fucking fly across the screen. There'll be blood everywhere, and it just looks really cool and visceral. So, I'm really glad to hear that they're putting that in. Now, a few of the other miscellaneous points, they're saying that it's being internally tested at the minute and the beta is coming soon, which probably means any time in the next 10 or 15 years. Uh, characters from the Lost Vikings will be there, there will be emotes for heroes, and there is going to be a Mac client. Then finally, they said that skins can cross over universes, so for example, you could have a demon hunter with a woe hunter skin. And that's really it for today's show, I hope you enjoyed it. Overall, some good news there, good discussion about the old, uh, the old flying. Um, sub races, I really hope they happen. I think racial diversity between all the different species in World of Warcraft would mean that you see a lot more like different player models rock walking around the place and a little bit like when I, I'm, say, going in Belfast where it's all completely homogeneous and white and then when I go to Dublin and it's a really cool cosmopolitan place, it's kind of fucking cool. So a little bit of that in World of Warcraft would be pretty damn nice. Anyway, that's it for today's show. And if you want to support the channel and stuff like that, you can check out the links in the description. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.